Okay, so we're about to begin an interview with uh, Dr. David Dressinger, and um, it is September 12th. Uh, Thanksgiving? October 12th. Uh, sorry, October 12th. Thank you. Thanksgiving. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, um, we are in Ottawa at the Science and Tech Museum, and uh, the interviewer, as usual, will be William McCray. So, uh, so let's begin. So could you please state your full name? My name is David Bruce Dreisinger. And uh, your age? I'm 57 years old this year. Yeah. And uh, where exactly were you born? I was born in Sudbury, Ontario, the nickel capital of the world. Yeah, it's very fitting for the interview. Yeah, yeah, very. Yeah. And uh, as a child, what did your parents do? Uh, my father had kind of a dual career. He was a forester. Uh, he worked the uh, first half of his career in the provincial government in the Department of Environment, looking at the effect of uh, sulfur dioxide pollution from the smelters on vegetation. And then halfway through his career, he actually switched to work for INCO and did the same sort of thing working with INCO, helping them understand better the impact of their operations on uh, forests and, and crops and that sort of thing and they're predicting what, what was happening with the pollution in the Sudbury area. What, uh, what years would have uh, that been in? Uh, I think he finished his career in the 1980s. Okay. So it would have been sort of from the, the uh, 50s till the 80s okay. in that time frame. Still yeah. uh, pretty early to see, uh, I guess, kind of um, a more environmental aspect to the... Uh, he, he was actually one of the very first, starting yeah. in government and then migrating into the, the company itself. One of the very first to start to look at that. As a kid, I can remember traveling around to uh, different sites around the Sudbury region, and even as far away as Wawa, where they had little pollution monitoring sites set up, where they'd measure the pH of rainfall and, and any uh, sulfur dioxide that actually got to the ground level would be detected by these monitors. So it was kind of a nice visual of what was happening with the area at the time yeah. growing up. Neat. Yeah. Yeah, so you would have been right in the middle of that uh, as, a, as a child. What did you do as a, as a pastime or for fun? I was an outdoors uh, aficionado. I'd love to canoe and fish and all those sorts of things. Northern Ontario is fantastic for that. So we spent a lot of time doing that in my youth. Okay. And uh, did you develop um, any kind of passion or interest for any form of sciences early on? Or? I had a passion for math. I had okay. a really good uh, math teacher in high school. Uh, named Mr. Savage, who was uh, quite an influence on me. He was my teacher all the way through high school in an advanced math class. And then I really enjoyed physics and chemistry and, and bio to somewhat of a lesser extent, but definitely chemistry, physics, and math were the three big ones. Yeah. Okay. And um, so from high school on, what, um, what, uh, what was going to be your path in life? Did you know as a well, high you know, schooler? I, I didn't know. I had a older as most sister. people older sister who uh, dated an engineer and he seemed to really like what he did and so when I got to the end of high school and thought what am I going to do with uh, math chemistry and physics as my background uh, I thought well Steve seems to like it I think I'll do it as well so I went off to Queens and did engineering that was my choice I applied at different schools but got accepted and went to Queens and uh, so I kind of stumbled into engineering a little bit and then uh, at the end of first year at Queens he had a choice of going into one area or the other kind of a general first year and then choosing coming out of first year going to second year. And I went to the metallurgy department as one of the open houses during the, the first year and uh, you know found a lot of common interests there and thought, uh, yeah, that sounds pretty interesting. I think I'm going to choose that and, and just basically chose that uh, subject at the time. So no great sort of epiphany when I was eight years old or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. It was more of an evolution and, and, and continues to be so. Yeah. As it is uh, with most people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. So, uh, so at university, were there any specific, um, very specific classes, um, or I guess even specializations that, that you really loved, or vice versa? Yeah, you know, I, I probably enjoyed more of the extractive side of metallurgy. So when I was being taught, there was sort of physical metallurgy, which was more, uh, you know, steel alloys and aluminum alloys and, and the different uh, you know, phys uses of metals rather than the extraction of metals. And I, I got more interested in the extractive side. I had one, one course in hydrometallurgy, which became my, my uh, career interest, which was probably the most interesting course I had in, in third year. And that sort of directed me. And the professor that was teaching that class, he ended up becoming my PhD supervisor. So we kind of tracked that in that direction. So early interest in about third year, and then that carried on through grad school and through the whole career. Did you, uh, did you go directly into grad school and then I, PhD? I did, yeah. Okay. I, I started a master's right after a bachelor's. And then at Queen's, you're allowed to do a transfer from master's to, bat, uh, to PhD if you did well enough in the first year master's. And I, oh, wow. I was fortunate enough to do that. So I 
didn't have to get a master's and just went right to the PhD. Yeah. Nice. And so what uh, was the PhD? What was the thesis? It was on uh, cobalt nickel separation. So I actually had some summer employment uh, with INCO at their research center after uh, my fourth year. So finishing a bachelor's, did a summer employment and then came back to school for the master's. And during that summer employment, um, uh, they said, well, why don't you do a thesis that's in interest in line with our interests? So we decided to do something on cobalt nickel separation. Because at that time, there were new chemicals that were coming out that were very good at separating those two metals, which in history have been quite difficult to separate. And so one of these chemicals was selected as the topic of my thesis. Okay. It's called a phosphonic acid uh, solvent extraction chemical, which allowed uh, cobalt to be recovered away from nickel uh, from a solution. And so that became the heart of my thesis, understanding the chemistry and the rates at which this, this chemical uh, separated different metals became the topic of my thesis. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, so afterwards, what uh, would you consider your first uh, official job in the field? Well, I went to uh, UBC, where I still am, in uh, 1984, and had a one-year postdoctoral fellowship appointment. So I, that was my first job coming out of my PhD. I literally finished, I think, on August 25th, my PhD defense at uh, Queen's on, in 1984, and then uh, started at UBC on the 1st of September. So it was a very rapid <laughs> transition. It was a couple of days late from my first day at work, uh, driving across the country, but uh, started for the one year. And, and, uh, and then, of course, that continued on into other, other positions at UBC, where I, where I still am some 30, uh, I guess, 31 years later. So you, you mostly, you've taught most of your life. You've been a, a prof, right? I, I have, yes. I've, I've, my main job has always been to be a professor at the university. But I've always had other interests as well and other, other roles and positions with different companies. But I've always been a professor over that period. What, um, what were your other roles? We'll get into uh, the teaching and uh, uh, the work at the university, but what uh, other roles have you done throughout your career? Well, in the mid-1990s, there was a lot of interest in... Uh, Vancouver is a very uh, interesting place because it's filled with companies that do exploration and develop new mineral properties. And there were a lot of uh, companies locally that were finding properties that needed metallurgical expertise to help them develop. So I started to do a lot of consulting in the 1990s after I became a professor at UBC. And some of those consultancies then evolved into uh, officer positions or director positions with companies where they asked me to formally take a role. It was still a consultancy type role, not a full-time role, but it became a you know, vice president of metallurgy or a vice president of processing or a director of the company. So that sort of thing took place over that period of time. Okay. Now you've done um, quite a bit of work in, uh, I guess one of your interests is um, technology development, but also technology transfer. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, one of the passions at UBC over the many years has always been on technology transfer, development and transfer. So we, our building at UBC is called the Frank Forward Building. Frank Forward was kind of a pioneer in technology development and transfer in hydrometallurgy at the university. His uh, experience was to work with the Sherrick Gordon Mines back in the 1950s. Uh, they discovered a mine in, in Manitoba that uh, was full of nickel. Uh, they didn't have a way to recover it. The other nickel companies at the time weren't willing to buy their concentrate, so there's no way to take their mineral and get it into metal without developing something of their own. And so uh, Frank Forward cooperated with the Sherrick Gordon Company at the time and developed the ammonia leaching process for nickel sulfides, which became the heart of the Sherrick Company as it still stands today. And so uh, starting with Frank Forward, Frank Forward's student was a fellow named uh, Ernie Peters, who was my mentor when I first went to UBC. He spent his whole life uh, working uh, interactively with industry, developing uh, ideas and technologies and trying to transfer them. And then that's continued uh, through my career afterwards. So I was sort of mentored into that role and, uh, and really thrived in it uh, after Ernie retired. Okay, so um, so this is it. That's a specific technology transfer you've, you're still working on, or are there many? No, I've, um, I've had a lot, lot of different things that I've worked on over the years. Um, I don't know if you'd like me to just sure. talk about them in general, but yeah, or, or go with the the ones you're proudest of, or yeah. So the, the ones I'm probably most proud of are, are ones that relate to uh, to copper and nickel and precious metal recovery. So going back again to the 1990s, one of the companies that approached me to help them with a the problem is a company called um, uh, Aberfoyle Minerals out of Australia. And they just discovered a very high grade uh, copper deposit in, in Queensland in Australia. Uh, they were trying to uh, recover the, the copper effectively, but couldn't do so by conventional mineral processing. And so they said, well, can you help us develop a hydrometallurgical process for it? 
and we developed one of the world's first uh, low temperature, low pressure autoclave processes for copper. So we were able to actually leach the copper directly from the ore under conditions that had never been used before, put all the copper or almost all the copper in solution and then uh, recover it by solvent extraction and electrolysis to make copper cathode, which is the final form of copper that was recovered. And that plant started in 1998 and ran for about five years till the ore was exhausted and uh, recovered about 50,000 tons a year of copper uh, over that period and was one of the uh, real technical successes of, of my, uh, my career. Um, that's gone on. I've, I've actually worked with a couple of other deposits of similar type. There was a mine up in, there still is a mine up in Laos in Asia, which um, had very similar ore to the one in, in Australia. And again, we developed a technology for that ore. It had to be a little bit different. We, we ran a, an open uh, tank leach rather than a pressure leach at that plant, and then they recovered uh, some of the, the, the waste minerals and converted those to acid and reagents to feed the rest of the plant. So we had a nice uh, uh, process development, a nice US patent again that was issued for the technology. And that started up in 2005 and has been running ever since. And now recovers about 90,000 tons a year of, of copper at that plant. Not bad. So uh, we've had a couple of, of successes like that. And, uh, and the one that's, that's still pending, which has been, it actually predates uh, both the previous examples, but because of, of delays in financing and permitting and all the other things that take place when you develop a mineral property, it's still pending as a development, is a technology called the Platzol uh, process which is kind of a marketing name for a technology that does uh, direct extraction of copper, nickel, uh, cobalt, platinum, palladium, gold, uh, silver, and, and other metals as well if they're present. Uh, but that technology was developed on behalf of a company called Polymet Mining mm -hmm. in uh, Minnesota. And uh, Polymet's still at the cusp of uh, permitting uh, success. We're hoping in the next uh, very short while to have our final environmental impact statement published. But Platzol was developed to uh, directly extract all those different metals from the ore in Minnesota. It's a very, a very complex uh, ore. The company's called Polymet because of the polymetallic nature of the ore. And uh, we're hoping to uh, get our permits and put that in, into uh, production fairly soon. Yes. How long has it been pending? Well, I think the process was developed in 1998. Wow. So it's uh, 17 years going on. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I think the patents are going to expire before the process is actually commercialized. Yeah. Yeah, which is, is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> no I'm kidding. Yeah. Now, if you go back to, uh, to Australia or, or, um, or Laos, um, how common is that in the world that, are, that there are ores that just are, you, you need uh, this specific type of, of extraction? Yeah, you know. How, how common is that? I think uh, I would say that each of those different ores are fairly unique. The, the ore in Australia has a direct analog in, in Spain. There's an ore in Spain that's uh, uh, been developed by Inmet, which is now part of First Quantum Mining from Canada. Uh, that ore is very similar to the one in Australia, and they developed okay. a, a process that had some elements of similarity for the one in Spain, and I'm, I'm involved in that one as well. I was involved with Inmet and now currently with First Quantum. Um, but you know, a lot of these deposits are one-off deposits. They're unique uh, okay. creations of nature. And you have to look at them very carefully and decide how best to approach them. So it's really hard to get a, a one-size-fits-all technology in the hydromet space. Uh, you always have different minerals present, different waste products that might be generated, different local environmental conditions. There's a lot of different varieties that present. So you've really got to be quite yeah. uh, careful about how you select and develop technology. Um, Every mind's a new puzzle, essentially. They, they are, and they're, they're fun from that perspective. <laughs> it's like a new crossword on Sunday morning. You know, it's... Uh, it's a different challenge to, to present itself. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. So those, those all would become technically different patents? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So the, the patent uh, from Australia was yeah, issued uh, first, and then the one in Laos second, and the, well, the other one from 1998 or so. I think it was maybe issued in the early 2000s, but filed in 1998. And I should have mentioned that that was a technology developed with uh, SGS Minerals okay. in Lakeville, Ontario, with a fellow named Chris Fleming. And also my, my consulting uh, comrade, uh, Terry O'Kane, who's now deceased. Uh, Terry, Chris, and I collaborated on that development uh, okay. for that plant salt process. Yeah. So how many patents uh, have you been involved with, or patents, inventions? I think I've, I've got about 19 U.S. patents. And, and of course, a lot of those are patent in other countries as well. Mm -hmm. But I don't, don't count those as separate patents because they're all the same patent, just filed in a different jurisdiction. <laughs> but about 19 inventions altogether. Well. Yeah. And do they all involve uh, extracting uh, different uh, mixtures of minerals 
Yeah, on the earth? yeah. Uh, well, they're all related to, to oh. mining and metals processing for sure. Okay. Some are related to uh, control of impurity elements in processing. Okay. So one of the uh, things I worked on over the years is looking at trying to get elements like antimony and bismuth away from copper, which is a common problem in copper refining. So one of the collaborations was with the Naranda company from Montreal. Naranda had a particular problem in that area. They ended up adopting our invention into the uh, refinery in Montreal. I also worked with a company that was um, spun off of the Department of Energy in Chicago, a company called iChrome Industries. They developed the new ion, ion exchange resin that was able to recover iron out of very strong acid solutions. And we use that to uh, purify copper electrowinning solutions, which are often contaminated with a little bit of iron. We used uh, the ion exchange process to selectively absorb the iron out of the electrolyte and transfer it out of the impure solution into a waste solution so as to keep the, uh, the main plant solution clean of iron. And that's been commercialized first in Mexico and then in Australia as well, at the same site actually as the autoclave was developed uh, oh. at Mount Gordon way back in the 1990s. Mm. Um, you mentioned uh, Polymet, mm -hmm. and you're also uh, <coughs> a member of Polymet Safety, Health and Environmental uh, Committee. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. So, uh, so I guess kind of slightly following in your father's footsteps in a way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you talk a bit about that work? Because that, that, that sounds quite interesting. Yeah. So as, as a board member for Polymet, uh, every year when we, we have our AGM, we kind of uh, put our hand up and volunteer for different committees. And uh, uh, one of the ones I've been involved in for a number of years now is the safety, health and, health and environment. And of course, that relates to uh, making sure that any work done at the site is done safely. And there's all sorts of legislation and regulation in the, in the United States, in particular, I guess, that uh, oversees that. So it's as a board member, you're trying to make sure that uh, the people that are running the company are paying attention to safety aspects and health aspects, and then making sure that all the environmental issues are, are well handled. Now, we're, in a, we're actually in a, an interesting site because we've got a, um, an older mine, which uh, was an iron ore mine, upon which we're now going to build our copper, nickel, and precious metal mine. So we've got sort of a historical legacy issue, you know, what to do with all the, all the historical mining activity at the site. So that's part of what's being managed by the environmental side of the company. And then there's also planning for future operations, which have not yet commenced. So looking at the, the past, we're trying to manage whatever releases uh, are coming from the old wastes that are present from the iron ore operation that we took over. And then we're trying to plan to make sure that anything that we do in the future uh, is fully uh, uh, within environmental uh, constraints to make sure there's no race of anything nasty to the environment. And that's all part and parcel of the technology development. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're trying, you know, specifically at Polymet, we try to uh, make sure we remove all sulfides or almost all sulfides from the ore uh, during our flotation process. So we're actually taking the ore, grinding it, taking all the sulfur minerals into to one stream and all the non-sulfide minerals go out to a waste impoundment that's very important because sulfide minerals in nature can, of course, release uh, uh, acid or, or uh, sulfates into the environment. So we want to absolutely make sure that's not an issue at the site. And then our process that treats the sulfide concentrates basically uh, uh, extracts all the metals and then stabilizes all the other stuff that comes from those minerals into a form that's stable for the environment. So we're planning to take care of the past and plan for the future in terms of what we're doing at the site. Yeah, a different type of, uh, of uh, I guess, history, yeah. um, managing history, but yeah, yeah. very interesting. Hmm. Um, now back to um, a, a very large part of your career, which is uh, the teaching aspect, the, yeah. the being a professor at UBC. Um, could you talk a bit about um, the, the classes you teach, maybe? Yeah, so I, I, I've taught a couple of different classes, well, quite a few different classes. I think starting uh, when I first became a professor, I got a first year chemistry class, which was absolutely terrifying <laughs> because you'd get it thrown into classes with 300 students, yeah. uh, about two thirds of which were going into engineering disciplines that didn't like chemistry, so they didn't really want to be there. <laughs> and then you're, you had to uh, maintain their interest over the, uh, the period. And there'd be two a day for about six weeks during the term. I didn't teach the whole course, I taught part of the course. Okay. But that was quite an experience, not, not necessarily to be repeated, I don't think. <laughs> And then I, I took that class here, took, but yeah, I took that class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Every first or every uh, first year uh, engineer tends to take that class. And then the other class I've taught are things like uh, specialist classes in hydrometallurgy. So those are just dealing with the chemical processing of minerals once again. 
So I've taught that at the third year level, the fourth year level, and the graduate student level. And then the other one that's really quite interesting was a, a course on metallurgical economics, which I'm still teaching to this day. And uh, when I first joined UBC and was working with Professor Peters, it was a class he taught for many years. And he said, Dave, if you want to make sure that uh, you get tenure and never get fired, teach this class because nobody else wants to teach it. So if you start to teach it, uh, nobody will want to uh, replace you because you'll have a job for life if you're willing to keep that class. And of course, that was a, a, was a joke at the time, but uh, it's become an invaluable class because it teaches you all about the, the uh, economic aspects of what you're doing in mineral treatment. Pretty, uh, pretty which important is in real life. <laughs> extremely important. Yeah, so we spent a lot of time actually talking about real life. We talk about all sorts of things related to uh, use of money in real life, you know, mortgages and pension plans mm -hmm. and annuities and all that sort of thing. But then we apply that to the mineral side as well and make sure that those personal finance issues are transferred into, uh, you know, what, what it means to run a company and how, how you make money as a company and all that sort of thing. So extremely valuable. And, and why uh, was it so uh, unpopular for the profs? I, I think because everybody likes to teach in their technical specialty. Okay. They prefer to do something like that rather than something that's more generic like that. Okay. And I don't think a lot of the other profs understand it as well as Ernie did and Ernie transferred that knowledge to myself. And then I've, I've, I've thrived with it. I've loved that course ever since I started to teach it. Okay. Yeah. Were there any um, parts, parts of your job, whether prof or, or on uh, with companies, uh, that you remember and consider being quite dysfunctional, whether it's a, a job, a project? You know, I, I saw that uh, question on your list, and I couldn't <laughs> really think of one offhand. I mean, in, in every human organization, you've got different levels of dis dysfunction, but there was nothing that ever stood out as being no. a disaster. And, and maybe I've just tried to avoid anything that looked like that going in. And so I haven't uh, sort of been a, been vict victim to that sort of a situation before. Uh, the un university itself, you know, I think is generally well run. It's, it's a collegial atmosphere. You know, you have a department head that uh, can influence you but not order you around and tell you what to do exactly. So you're really you're, you're master of your own destiny at the university, which is just fantastic. You know, if you have an interest, you can pursue it. If you want to do a certain research project, you can do it as long as you can develop the resources to mount it. And then working with companies, um, you know, I tend to, to find companies that I have an affinity for in terms of their technical challenge and what I can bring to the party. And uh, in almost every case, that's been a very enjoyable experience. So I, I can't really claim any large uh, episodes of dysfunctionality in, in, my, in my past that way. I guess that's good. That's yeah, yeah, I would say so, <laughs> yeah. Um, did you, uh, throughout your career, have you joined any professional organizations? or? Yeah, I've always been a member of uh, CIM, <coughs> going back to my student days. I've also been a member of TMS, uh, the Minerals, Metals, and Materials Society in the United States. I was a member of the SME in the United States for some time mm -hmm. as well, but it was kind of duplicative with the TMS, so I didn't continue. And I've been a member of the Association of Professional Engineers in BC since about 1987, so I have a PNG sure. designation as well. <coughs> and then I guess the other, other thing I've got is uh, a fellowship of the Canadian Academy of Engineers. So that goes back a number of years now as well. So that would be an organization that I'm a member of as well. Okay. Have you ever played uh, roles in them? Yeah, with the CIM, I certainly have. So I've, I've led the hydrometallurgy section, which is one of the more active sections within the Metallurgical Society. Uh, so for a number of years, I was the chair of that committee and been very involved in organizing conferences over the years. So going back to 1992, when my professor Ernie Peters was retiring, I mounted the Peters Symposium in Vancouver as kind of a... A mem uh, not a memorial, uh, but a celebration of his career. And so we had about 200 and some people come and, and uh, spend a number of days in Vancouver during that time. Had a very successful conference and been involved in one in Winnipeg a number of years later. Been involved in the Copper series of conferences, which have been quite prominent within the Metallurgical Society. And then in 2014, we, we hosted Hydrometallurgy 2014 in Victoria. Okay. So myself and a couple of colleagues from UBC were, were instrumental to organizing that. And uh, so, yeah, I've been very much involved in that regard. Were you, uh, did you go this year uh, to METSOC in Toronto? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Yeah, I was there as well. Yeah, I was there as well. Oh, you were? Okay. Interviewing yeah. uh, quite a few people. Oh, okay. Yeah. That would have been another chance to have met. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right on. Um, so, maybe we'll switch a little bit um, the theme to um, more the social, a few more social questions. Um, if we talk about women, and I always find it quite interesting because it is a, um, in general, it is a <clears throat> a world where there aren't or weren't a lot of uh, 
a lot of women present. So, so throughout your career, yours is more academic, so it might be might be different. But uh, throughout your career, how present or absent were women, and how has that changed or or not? Yeah, I think there's been quite an evolution in our industry. When I was uh, a high school student, I started working. I think one year in an underground mine, Franco. One year at uh, at the smelter, Franco. I don't remember any significant number of women working in either of those sites when I was working at that time. <clears throat> I worked at the uh, copper refinery in Montreal for after my second year. Um, there was, I don't remember any any uh, large number of women working at that site. Um, and then again working at INCO, uh, their J.R. Gordon Research Labs back in 80 and 81, uh, there were a few women in research but not a large number. And certainly all the senior leadership positions were, were for men. But I think over the years that's changed quite a bit. There's more and more uh, women entering the field. A lot of uh, chemical engineers have been migrating, I think, into to the field of metallurgy. As the number of metallurgy schools have diminished in Canada, there's, there's kind of an increase in supply of people from that other discipline into our field. And chemical engineering is a field that tends to attract women more readily, I think, than traditional metallurgy. And so there's been, been more and more women entering the field from that direction. One of my daughters, I've, I've actually got a son and a daughter who are both chemical engineers. My son works up at Goldcorp currently at, at the Muscle White Mine. My daughter's in second year chemical engineering and is working uh, for the tech corporation for the summer. So she's doing a co-op uh, placement in Vancouver and doing pressure leaching and solvent extraction and all there the things go. that I love to do. <laughs> so we can finally have an extended discussion over dinner at yeah, night yeah. Uh, <laughs> about our respective uh, activities. And yeah. Get everybody else... Uh, yeah lost in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's interesting because in her, her employment as a young chemical engineer, she's finding an awful lot of young women role models. So some of the senior managers that she's working with are women, and mm -hmm. she's uh, very happy to work with them and learn from them. So okay. I think that things are, are changing quite dramatically. We just hired two uh, new professors in extractive metallurgy in our department at UBC, uh, one in hydrometallurgy, one in pyrometallurgy, and both are women. So we're seeing more and more uh, women coming and, and want to, of course, encourage that. It's a lot bigger too in the chemical engineering, but also uh, environmental sciences. As well. Yes, That's yeah, environmental science often now. often is is a, a, a quite a, a draw for yeah. young women. Yeah, that tends to be the case. Yeah, mm. and a lot, and throughout my interviews, a lot of the the women I've seen or, or heard of have also been in sustainable development. That's another mm -hmm. big aspect uh, in in the mining and metallurgy world. Right. Um, now another question um, regarding. Society, I guess, would be: Do you think there is a, a disconnect between um, the mining and metallurgy world uh, and its industries and the general public? And if so, why? If not, why? Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, the industry is, is sometimes, or in some quarters, is viewed as kind of a an older sunset industry or or an industry from the last centuries. But of course, since the dawn of time, we've needed materials. And uh, into the future, no matter what sort of high-tech applications we can envisage, we need uh, materials. So the extraction of, of uh, materials from the earth is always going to be part of our, our society until we get to the point where we can just recycle everything 100% and then don't have to ever touch the earth again. Uh, but for the, for the foreseeable future, we're going to be extracting things from the earth. I think that um, a lot of perceptions of our industry are from the past. So I grew up in, in uh, Sudbury, Ontario. I can remember as a young child that the, uh, the Nassau astronauts, before they came to, uh, went to the moon, they actually came to, to Sudbury to drive their lunar lander around mm. the landscape because our landscape looks so much like the moon. And of course, that was a, a legacy from when they first started smelting nickel ore. They used to roast at, at, at ground level, cut down all the trees to make a fire, burn the rock at... Uh, at uh, ground level, and any sulfur dioxide gas that released basically rolled across the landscape, and, and whatever trees they hadn't cut down were then killed by the sulfur dioxide. So you can imagine what that did to the landscape. And I'm pleased to say a lot of that's recovered uh, in the time between the 70s and now, but uh, in the 1970s it was quite a, a, a nasty looking uh, landscape growing up. Uh, so I think you know a lot of our perceptions of, of the industry relate to things that happened 40, 50, 100 years ago and are not currently uh, um, uh, uh, proper perceptions of what's taking place. And the industry, you know, the industry is made up of people from the general population. None of us want to do any damage to the environment. None of us want to leave any bad legacy for the future generations. We want to do things properly and responsibly and, and make sure that we don't leave a, 
uh, footprint that uh, you know is going to be damaging to future generations. Thank you. Um, this uh, next question could be a, a tougher, I guess, loaded question, but but it is an important question, and that's in your opinion. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, events, people, inventions, um, contributions, disasters, anything really that uh, you deem must be mentioned when talking about the natural resource world in Canada? Any people's events, disasters? Yeah, a any, whether it be um, people who've played, who, who, who you deem have played a significant role um, uh, nationally, or maybe it's a specific event or disaster that has changed um, Canada um, in that regard. It could be a specific invention, anything really. Anything that comes out, sticks out to you when discussing the natural resources in Canada. Yeah. I think in terms of people, more more than events or disasters and things like that, and you know, I, I think I mentioned my mentor, Professor Peters, many mm -hmm. times. I, I think, in my experience, he was one of the ones that had the biggest influence on me in terms of my development. I can remember when I first came to UBC, uh, he asked me for a copy of my PhD thesis, and he said he wanted to read it. I'd come from Queens to UBC to work. He wanted to read it so he can understand what I knew and then make sure that while I was working with as, as a postdoc, he could teach me what I didn't know. And so I can remember about two weeks after he got a copy of my thesis, he invited me to his office for a discussion. And it's very interesting because when you first when you do a PhD, you're very narrowly focused in a certain mm -hmm. area. And you don't really think about what happens before the area that you're studying or what happens after, what happens all around. You're just narrowly focused. And so he started asking me questions about uh, you know, what comes before, what comes after, and I had very few good answers for him. <laughs> And I can always remember him looking at me and saying, you don't really know much about metallurgy, do you? <laughs> Ouch. And, and then uh, I remember having a choice. I could either try to bluff my way through and, you know, protest that I do more, knew more than he thought I knew, or I could say, uh, you know, please teach me. And, uh, and I chose the second path. And he spent the next uh, three or four, uh, ten years, because he worked probably till about 1994 or so at the university. But uh, he and I would have coffee together. We'd uh, spend a lot of time in his office together just chatting about all the things he knew about metallurgy and all the lessons he wanted to pass on. So I kind of got an oral history, if you will, <laughs> of, of metallurgy from Ernie Peters. You know, his, his experience dated back to the 1950s. He'd been there through the Sherat development, uh, uh, or, or shortly after the Sherat development. He was very much involved with the Kaminko company on, on a process called the, the zinc pressure leach technology developed by uh, Sherat Gordon and, and applied first at Kaminko up at Trail. So there were kind of these milestone technologies that were explained and understood over the years through this uh, personal relationship that, that uh, Ernie Peters and I had over those years. So I think, uh, you know, presence of a strong mentor, somebody that kind of puts context to the whole industry and all the significant events of the industry was, was one of my uh, most memorable experiences there. Good. Thank you. Um, also could, could be considered a, a tough question, but what are you proudest of in life? And we can divide it into, we could say, what are you proudest of in life? And also, what are you proudest of professionally? Yeah, well, I have four wonderful children, so full stop, I'm proudest of them in life. Uh, on, on the metallurgy side, I'm, I'm, I think I'm generally proud of the ability to uh, work closely with industry to solve problems and develop creative solutions that, that actually address the real problems that they're facing in metal extraction. Uh, this polymet project that I spoke about earlier, uh, the way the, the, that development came about was that uh, Terry O'Kane and I, who were working on a project in Mexico called the Baleo Project at the time, were spending time at SGS Minerals on the Baleo Project, and the SGS Minerals people kept talking about uh, this project that came back every couple of years by, with a new owner, where they tried yet again to solve this metallurgical problem in Minnesota, this polymet project, and they try some new flotation process or some new mineral separation process, but could never actually solve it. And during that period of time, there were a lot of developments in hydrometallurgy. And we suggested to the owners of the company, we said, why don't we start looking at some creative hydrometallurgy solutions rather than always going back and trying to do some you know, flotation process, which was the kind of the tried and true technology of the past. And so that spawned the, uh, the looking at the development that led to the Platzol process. We tried biological leaching, we tried atmospheric leaching, we tried uh, pressure cyanidation, we tried all these different technologies, and then settled on high temperature oxidation in an autoclave with a bit of salt 
So it was a salt-assisted leach, and that was able to ex actually extract all the metals into solution in one step and very much simplify the recovery of metals from that deposit. And I think that collaboration, and it really was a, a collaboration, uh, Chris Fleming was the senior uh, inventor on that technology. Terry and I uh, worked with him on that uh, technology. But that was probably one of my proudest moments to, to actually create a solution for that deposit, which yeah. was discovered in 1969. Still not discover, still not developed in 2015, but getting closer by the day as we approach our permitting. Crazy yeah. when you think about it. Yeah, yeah. and that's not not, uh, not all that uh, unusual in the mineral field, where there's a discovery, something's uh, you know sitting on the shelf for a long period of time until some kind of technology or economic event comes along, where suddenly it becomes valuable and, and can be yeah. put into production. I don't know if this is possible to answer, but. Um, is there a, a would you say there's a large percentage of of mineral deposits in the world that are still not impossible to to um, to extract but but so difficult to distract still uh, extract still today that um, they aren't well there's there's a huge range of discoveries of different deposits and and of course if they're not developed it's because there's not a market for the product or they're not economic mm -hmm. or there's some environmental consequence that can't be be maintained. So I think there's a huge inventory of those projects out there, and there's new ones being discovered every day. Yeah. So all the, you know, we have the saying, all the easy ones are gone. Yeah. Right. And so the hard ones are left, which, which okay. means that you know the the future for my field is quite bright, because we're we're in the business of hopefully adding value to those hard ones in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, now, if you were to talk to um, someone much younger, like uh, a student, for example. My daughter. <laughs> or your daughter. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, um, what's the most important life lesson or piece of advice you would give them when, when looking at their future career? Or... Yeah, I think the uh, most important thing probably is to, to work hard and just respond to opportunity when it knocks so that uh, you, know, you, you can only uh, react to opportunity when it presents itself sometimes, but you've got to be prepared when it comes and be willing to, to do things that are kind of outside your comfort zone. I can remember one of my early experiences at UBC was uh, a fellow that was an uh, alumnus of UBC was developing a copper mine in Chile and he was using bacteria to leach copper and he was having trouble developing the right bacterial strains and the right process conditions and everything else to uh, leach copper in Chile, partly because there was lots of chloride or salt in the water that was affecting the bacteria um, health and so he came and we convened a meeting of the geologists, the, the chemical engineers, the microbiologists, the mining engineers, and the metallurgists. And he kind of presented this problem and asked the question, you know, can you help? And, uh, and I was the first one to put up my hand and I said, well, we'll try. And we'd never done anything in biological leaching before, but we thought, why not uh, give it a try? And so we actually, you know, worked with one of our former uh, um, uh, graduates who'd gone into the biological field started to develop a program and started to do work on that project in Chile. It was a tremendous example of you know, being willing to uh, learn something new, uh, take on a new challenge, and, and be willing to, uh, to learn and to help. And I think that, that's probably one of the best life lessons for young people. Don't be so wedded to one thing that you want mm -hmm. to do, but be prepared for opportunity and be prepared to step in boldly and, and give it yeah. a try. Say yes. Say yes. Like, yeah, yes, yeah, man. That's right. <laughs> or yeah, the Jim Carrey uh, film was <laughs> yeah. one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got him into trouble a few times, but generally was a good attitude for him. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to, like to share with me or, or add? Yeah, I think the, the mining industry is a tremendous industry for Canada. You know, I, I view it as one of the backbone parts of our economy and, and backbones of our, our national psyche, if you will. You know, we are uh, people that know how to discover minerals. We do it in Canada. We do it all over the world. We uh, try to do it uh, very largely environmentally responsibly, uh, economically efficiently, and, and are leaders in the field, and, and that hopefully will continue far into the future. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay.